Hello, everyone, and welcome to Performance Anxiety's 15th online reading event. My name is Tom Snarski, and I'm happy to be the MC of tonight's reading. In case you haven't listened in before, Performance Anxiety is an online reading series hosted via Skype, usually on the third Thursday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. At each of our events, we usually feature up to around 10 readers who each have about five minutes to share a selection of their writing with us. Tonight, we have eight wonderful poets and writers who are here to share their poems and stories with you. So these slots will be a little longer to make space for all the beauty and brilliance you're about to hear. Uh, this many slots every month means we're always looking for readers, though. So if you're a poet or a writer who's interested in sharing your work at a future event, you're more than welcome to get in touch with us via the at Performance Anxiety, Performance A-N-X-T uh, on Twitter, Twitter account, or by DMing the co-organizers directly. I'm at Tom Snarsky, T-O-M. S-N-A-R-S-K-Y on Twitter and Instagram, uh, or you can email me at tomsnarski at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with Kristen Garth, the other co-organizer of the series, whom I'll introduce in just a few minutes when she shares her poems. Uh, but first, I'm very excited to welcome our first reader of the evening, uh, M. Neifel. Uh, M is reviews editor at The Puritan, an associate editor at Theta Wave, and the creator of the web show Playdates and the collective poetry project Catch. They are currently dating a cardinal. Em, I couldn't be more excited to hear what you're going to read tonight. Thanks so much for being with us and take it away. Thank you so much, Tom. And also, Kristen, also for clarification, when I say cardinal, I do mean the bird, not the uh, religious figure. Uh, <laughs> okay, cool. So um, the first thing I'm going to read is um, about, it's a, a rewrite of the like classic Samson and Delilah story um, in which, uh, Delilah cut Samson's hair to save him. Um, and I chose it because my hair is growing out and I'm thinking a lot about hair. Okay. Samson. Also, I have a dog with me who is snoring very loudly. Samson. She traced his sleep, shallow breather, shadow mountain, wound through the ribs of his sheetless night his heavy hair clutching his moonful breasts, her other hand under pillow clasped her mother's good pair of scissors, cold metal like the cat's gaze, which carved her out from the silence. Bracing his scalp, she tugged all his hair into eight spreading braids, snagged an elastic, snapped, she upheld, ready, but their forked ends were drooping with heat. And she, no, stay. She, oh, fell asleep till his breath gurgled, gug, the undoing ropes flexing and writhing into his glint. With both of her hands, with all of her weight, she hacked closer and closer to his skull, his skin, and where she slammed the two blades into one, each hair brittled, then sparked Delilah the first morning in apricot light. The single hair they pulled out from deep in her throat. That time the moon went unspilled for a week. His left thigh sweet sticky as rice. Her fist a brim with the scrunchie they lost. And then the strands wilted and it was dark. He gulped awake, eyes haloing his face, hands haloing his clumsy new head, saw her seeing him and crushed into his palms because the thing about potential energy is it doesn't unshatter. But she clung to his shoulders, tried to smooth his blunt hair, said, I know, I knew, and she did. She knew from following the veins up his arms from fitting her ear into his, from wishing her wishes onto his eyelids. So he let her hold on, fingers tight as attention, let her whisper the truths that condensed up his neck. Sam, son, Sam, son, Samson, Samson. Okay. Um, the Second thing I'm gonna read is um, about recognizing someone that you haven't recognized in a long time. It's called pooling. He howls at the empty tree full of leaves. 
She dreams she sinks in the deep end twice, too weak, too weak to walk up the stairs. Her echo green arms trail her as I do, as light wobbles the trees, as a great, a great wealth reflected. Her certain neck steadies her bobbing away from us and toward the well's sinking floor. The dog and I sob with our overturned mouths. That is the, my own hairline clutching her bun. That is the person I lost for forever. He scrabbles at the edge of the pool of himself, barks, stop, don't stay, but I just, just watch. I stop, stay, trace her out with my shrinking throat gulps, knowing I will never catch it, that there, the edge of the ebb of her glow. And lastly, um, I'm going to read uh, one of a series um, that, of poems that I wrote about just uh, how it feels to be with my little brother um, and also a porous being in the world, um, which is to say just a being. It's called uh, Home Alone 3 or Trouve le Trou, which in French means find the hole. I spill shut the screen door leap outside and over this brother, his torso diagonaling the L of the couch. I tuck into the triangle of cushion left over, crack open the knuckle of book. T'as trouvé le trou, she used to say, when I clambered behind her knees barricade, let my legs dangle like over an inner tube, all full of air for a second while we watched the shows I liked for their voices. Trouve, trouve, the hole in the word already, a gape in the middle of finding. I look, I find them all, boundless and widening, like the one at the knee of his pants that he jams with his shirt. I still remember the last of his umbilical cord. Oops, I'm so sorry. I skipped a line. Um, like the one at the knee of his pants that he jams with his finger, proud because it came from his wearing them, or the tiny awning of belly button under his shirt. I still remember the last of his umbilical cord curled up in there until it blackened and fell like a crumbling wick. The spot just above that caves with exhales, his cavity eyes, light sharding and tumbling, but never filling them. Until his eyelids tuck him away and I'm relieved. Until his mouth slips open and I think, of course. The curse of semi-permeability is that there's always a way for it all to get in. The black sky lifted away from us, abyss of air that we move through. I loop my foot through his ankle's blank tunnel and think, okay, but for now we are whole as the word itself chasms and drops through my mouth. Did I go totally over? I was not on the same screen. No, don't worry about it at all. There is no such thing as over. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, M, for, for those poems and for starting us off with the scissors of Delilah and ending us with an umbilical cord. That was super <laughs> rad. And again, that was that was Emily Neifel who joined us here tonight, yeah. who you can find at Twitter at Emily, E-M-I-L-I-E, Neifel, K-N-E-I-F-E-L. Uh, and on um, emilyneifel.com, you can find a lot of the work that they do, including Playdates, which is the collective or the uh, web show that you can find on Instagram and Twitter, Play D8. Uh, and also catch this collaborative poetry project they're working on is at Butterfingers, B-T-E-T-R-F-I-N-G-E-R-S on Twitter. So thank you so much again, Em, for leading us off tonight. Uh, and I'm really excited to transition into my, the person who I'm privileged to call my 
uh, co-organizer for performance anxiety, Kristen Garth. Um, Kristen Garth is a pushcart, best of the net, and Riesling nominated sonnet stalker. Her sonnets have stalked journals like Glass, Yes, 521, Luna Luna, and more. She's the author of 16 books of poetry, including Pink Plastic House from Maverick Duck Press, Crow Carriage from the Hedgehog Poetry Press, Flutter, Southern Gothic Fever Dream from Twisted Press, The Meadow from Apep Publications, which I had a lot of fun reviewing, and Golden Ticket, which is forthcoming from Roaring Junior Press. She's the founder of Pink Plastic House, a tiny journal, and the co-founder as well of Performance Anxiety, this very online poetry reading series. So thanks so much, Kristen. Sorry that Niles had some say while you were being introduced, my cat who's recovering <laughs> from surgery. Um, thanks so much as always for being here. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a couple of poems to start off with that are about addiction in different ways. And um, the first one is from a manuscript I just turned in to APEP that'll come out maybe at the end of this year or beginning of next, I'm not sure yet, but it's called um, The Stakes. And it's about fire being used against women as a tool of misogyny and women being disproportionately punished in history with fire. And it also deals with my own abuse because my father was a firefighter. So hence my obsession, I think, with fire. But anyway, um, called Chelsea Jardin, and I wasn't exposed to a lot of museums or poets, things like that growing up, but my parents who were Mormon would take us to a lot of movies as long as they were PG. And one time they took us to was Legal Eagles. And that's what this poem is about. It was the first time I saw a trauma artist perform and she was doing performance art piece and Daryl Hannah in that movie. And it's called Chelsea Jardin. She sleeps inside talk outline of what remained when she turned nine after she climbed last time into an alabaster iron bed piece of cake a platinum head singe forever in father's studio how many daddies must she show the blaze of her biography from flickers follows please to stay so I'd promise to obey if they could only penetrate a corpse with foreknowledge without remorse. Coffin flavored birthday cake, favorite artist his burning makes, her pale palette crimson, her body brush detailing both their deaths. What she will offer next is what is left. And the next poem is it just, um, I watched like a lot of people during the pandemic, the Tiger King. And at first I watched the Tiger King, I first only said the only thing I can relate to in this is the tigers. Like I didn't like any of the humans, but it was kind of dishonest because I had um, in my younger years, a lot of addiction problems. And I actually really related to this one character, Travis Maldonado, who was very depressed and added Travis by his addictions in a life he did not want to be in until finally he lost that battle. And I um, wrote my own poem about my sex addiction and drug addiction. And it's called a Tiger King. <laughs> Once, almost a smoothie king, I met on cocaine at a rave one night. Said I wouldn't, but I knew I might. I had let his kind inside before who offered lines, even one who called me a whore to the entire population of our punk rock bar. Was not there, but words travel far in itty bitty southern towns of Wednesday Adams fleshlights and skin tight velvet gowns. Who would swallow anything to forget? I know I am no different than a teenager who put on a ring by methamphetamines damned to wed tiger kings, lives we can't abide. I too fucked men who made me want to die. And um, the next two poems are from a horror um, book that I'm writing and it kind of shows of one character called the Mistress of Malice, who is a character kind of like me that she had a very bad beginning, although she becomes kind of a character while in the book herself. But then she goes on a little arc and has some changes. And I'm going to read two poems, one where she's stuck in the bad place and she's getting ready to kill her family. <laughs> and um, the second one is when she realizes later when she's in a basement that, you know, 
she's going to change her ways. They did not know. In shovel mirror, you will stare, pilfered brush, poised in midair, like serrated blade a stranger proffered late last night. Silver lessons against your ribcage, light. Made a dimming map, organs, veins, bloodletting explained, damp skin, arterial spray, how deep daggers descend in denouement of tragedy. Close your eyes not to pray. See skeletons resembling family or guardians for little whores. Open eyes your unmentionable drawer. Key is blade when you are ready to begin. I've been inside, but they did not know. When pupil widens, you release a crow. Um, and then second one is the basement poem. This is where you disappear. This is where the girl plays dead. Let thoughts tumble from limp, thrown back head, which peers wrong side up forbidden flights, carried, caught in coffin night. His footsteps in her ears descend. She fears too many stairs, a place she has not been. Goosebumps on shuttered skin. Temperature declining, quick as he does chase, from light the amia echoed waste. Grim squeaks, minute feet, compound sounds of a captivated heart. Sleeping seraphim upon a mattress in the dark. He lays and brushes tendrils from a trembling ear, so you hear. This is where you disappear. And my last poem, I'm going to end on a happy, happy note, is um, from my collection from Roaring Jr. And it's kind of darker poems from Flip Factory. And this one is about Prince Pondicherry, who in the book um, ends up, he requests a chocolate house to live in in India, and he ends up drowning, or, or swimming inside of it, but in my poem, he drowns. Delicious death. So, anyway, here we go. Death by chocolate, or the last Pondicherry. Since shouted the prince, I'm not going to eat my palace. I'm not even going to nibble the staircase or look I'm going to open it, Pondicherry, to Willy Wonka. Is death delicious in a chocolate house? Does it wiggle from a black forest hole, a small white chocolate mouse? Closet baseboard detail of normality he forced into your chocolate castle fantasy. Coy contractor chocolatier, overnight palace appears. Before the boiling sea, he fears, when chocolate walls meet sunrise, in India and capsize, into yard, mint chocolate blades, swim against the frothed cocoa waves. Hundred rooms, bricks of bars liquefied, swallowed under stars. The trough of death commissioned becomes bittersweet, rodent cherry cordial heart between your teeth. Thanks. Thank you so much, thank Kristen, so much, as Kristen. always. And thank you for uh, sharing some of the work from, again, that's Golden Ticket, which is forthcoming from Roaring Junior Press, Kristen's book, um, mm -hmm. in conversation with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, mm -hmm. which I also just learned is her son's first uh, series book, which is also really cool to kind of ground in literature at this time, especially. Um, so if you want to find more of Kristen's work, you can always follow her on Twitter at Lola and Jolie, L-O-L-A-A-N-D-J-O-L-I-E. And her website, Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, Garth.com, uh, always has awesome information about the, the projects that just keep coming. So we're really excited, Kristen, for the book. And I'm also really excited to introduce our next reader, whose work I got to know a little bit um, before Z came on to uh, Performance Anxiety, Gretchen Rockwell. Um, Gretchen Rockwell is a queer poet and supplemental instructor of English at the Naval Academy Preparatory School in Newport, Rhode Island. So her work has appeared in Glass, Poets Resist, Kissing Dynamite, Noble Gas Quarterly, Freeze Ray Poetry, and elsewhere. Z enjoys writing poetry about gender and sexuality, history, space, and unusual connections. Thanks so much, Gretchen, for being with us. I'm really excited to hear your work tonight. All right, 
thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, so the first poem that I'm going to read uh, is going to get into uh, history, nature, science, and unusual connections. So I'm just going to go for it. Um, the title is Ouroboros, and if you're not familiar with what an Ouroboros is, it is um, it's a snake that eats itself. So it's just constantly eating its own regenerating tail. So Ouroboros. The first time I saw the sharp silhouettes, I couldn't fumble fast enough to capture a photograph. Indian flying foxes, bats remembered from a weird and wild creatures card collected at 10, when I thought I wanted to be a biologist before I realized I'd have to do science. Then I traded that flying fox card for a Cerberus one, caring more about the spider web of wonder between literary and literal. These days, I prefer nature in its unnerving wonders. Who needs Athena splitting Zeus's skull when mind-controlling jewel wasps exist, spiking into lesser insects and hijacking them as a host for their spawn, which eat the corpse inside out and emerge fully formed? I still have a favorite fantastical creature, the phoenix, whose nature is self-immolation. In reality, the mechanism is rarely so static as fire. Instead, often a living instrument, nature curling in on itself in an endless wheel. The shadow of death takes the shape of wings or fangs or the leafy fronds of a fern unfurling. The lesson is, nature will kill you eventually, from the inside out or as another of its incarnations. Still, I prefer its marvels over myth. How certain seeds can only bloom after being burned, flowers exhaling open after forest fires, ash still hanging thick in the air while something new pokes through, life wriggling out through the cracks. Uh, this next poem gets into my, uh, my love of history and my fascination with Castle Explorer when I was a child, um, when I had endless fun running about this uh, historical castle. Um, so it's about, it's called, it's about uh, the alchemist and it's called the alchemist daughter knows the properties of iron and how elements hiss and bubble when combined. Carefully, she eats to balance her excess yellow bile while she pours over the philosophy of the body. She pestles nettles, thyme, mandrake, blending remedies for the little aches and pains. And though it is not the panacea her father seeks, it is its own transmutation. Outside the bailey walls, she searches for soft feathers of sage and sweetleaf pennyroyal, which she will gather into bunches to perfume her rooms, thick loam and grass rich in her nose. She learns not to burn the candle she dips too long to justify her labor, and how long she must leave her curdles to steep, growing matter red for the winter. Her father spends his days staring at his scribbles, ignoring the draft she leaves to soothe his cough. The alchemist's daughter uses the letters she knows to scratch out failures and successes in spidery script similar to the cobwebs she uses to wrap wounds. This amuses her makes her consider the connectedness of all elements, the way threads might loop unseen between bodies. She wonders if her father sees them. This next poem is in, it's in four parts. Um, I'm going to forget to tell you the part number, so I'm just going to pause between them. Uh, it's uh, called Heliocentric. It's about the sun uh, in, a couple, in a couple different ways. So Heliocentric. Sun worship spans the globe, taking many names, though not as many as the times the sun has risen. The same cannot be said for the sun's names. Earth's sun is a G-type main sequence star and should burn for more than five billion years when it will become a red dwarf and then metamorphose again. The first thing I learned in yoga at dawn on an Indian rooftop was a salutation. We didn't have mats, and the concrete was gritty and cold, smearing white on our feet, satellite dishes and wires fencing us in, linen strung over clotheslines to dry, the view of the courtyard. Stop. Stop now. You are meant to be meditating. Let everything disappear but the vinyasa flow. Surya Namaskar. Soak in the light, the warmth, like a plant, like a battery. 
letting it fill your cells and transmute itself, not like the alchemists of old thought to turn metal into gold, but into energy, the most precious resource besides time. Time enough to let yourself drift, your own body pulled in its orbit as if you were a planet of your own, singing through space you inhabit. Smile, then feel your mouth, relax. No words are needed. Breathe, listen. And the salt breeze investigating my eyelids says beautiful. And the kiss of the sun on my cheekbones says beautiful. And the stone which like me is not wholly warmed yet says, and the crack of my lips where they part says beautiful. And the clementine juice in my mouth and my Sekhmet hand gripping the invisible onk says beautiful and my useless soft tongue in my mouth says beautiful. The wind blows into the cavern of my rib cage, and each ray sinks into my skin and says soft, says open, says beautiful. And so I'm going to close with uh, one final poem, which is about beauty, um, and it's based on a, a scientific article I read last last week, very recently, within the past couple weeks, about Spinosaurus. Um, and all you really need to know is going to be in the title. So, I share an article announcing Spinosaurus is now confirmed to be the first aquatic dinosaur. And when my friend Kay says she loves the mermaid Spinosaurus, I nearly cry. Because I love dinosaurs with unholy glee. And I didn't think to call them that. Would never have. And even now, with everything going on in the world, I can still be struck numb with beauty. Even the idea of it. And Kay is right. I imagine Spinosaurus Egypticus gliding through the murky rivers, monster and mystery and mermaid all at once, all teeth and tail. And this is beautiful. To me. Which maybe says something about my idea of beauty. In that post, I said I'd had a sad and stressful day. And Kay said... I'm also in love with the fact they proved it by building a giant robot tail and thrashing it about in various simulations. Also, if you need to chat, I'm around. And I too love the idea of making a robot mimic emotion, something ancient coming back to life in some small way. And this says something about my idea of beauty too, but maybe also something about love and joy and how my friends know me so well and how even now, with everything going on in the world. I am in good hands. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Gretchen. That brings me back to, I, I teach a class in, uh, for high schoolers on research. And last year, one of the papers, the example papers that I got to read was about a student who made a machine that was representing dinosaurs fighting each other. And so I'll share that with you after, which because that just feels super appropriate. But again, that was uh, Gretchen Rockwell. I will absolutely do that. Um, that was Gretchen Rockwell sharing her work. Um, and you can follow Gretchen on Twitter at daft underscore Rockwell, D-A-F-T underscore R-O-C-K-W-E-L-L. -L. Um, and you can find her website at GretchenRockwell.com. Um, Gretchen also has forthcoming micros, uh, Thanatology in the Ghost City Summer Series, and Love Songs for Godzilla, Speak of the Dinosaur theme from Kissing Dynamite. Um, so our next reader, our halfway point of the evening, uh, is a person who I'm very privileged to get to read his poems on the reg. And I'm also very excited, speaking of the Ghost City Summer Series, to have a, a small chap of very, very small sonnet-esque poems coming out with him uh, at the end of the summer. This is Joe Iani. And Joe is a poet and performance artist from Toronto. He needs no further introduction. Thanks, Joe. And I can't wait to be a part of this reading, I think. Yeah. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I hope this thing's working. So we'll start with this one. The room was dressed up. A coffee table shaped like a kidney bean. A vintage bronze Chinese pot. A small red animal bed bearing a wet ring. Denuded of soil or fur or coffee mugs. A brick picked pieces of glass up at the party. A vibration suddenly rang through the room, carrying a message which read, this text has no body.
someone decides to steal lightning from the Webster's Dictionary. Left in its place is a tract of land where people live happily in the absence of certain terms. They say, my heart's stained, where you might say, there's a hole in my heart, as if it were a spot you happened on by accident and could remove with, begrudgingly, <clears throat> the right and expensive detergent. When someone finally brought the word back, there were ups and downs. Someone said, quote, sorry it took so long, end quote. They said, quote, I only meant to borrow it, end quote. But by that time, some people moved on, learned to live without, or thought they couldn't really incorporate it into their daily vocabulary. Sort of like a rogue puzzle piece. The shape fit, but the color was pale blue, not eggshell. Pam's confidence was head-to-toe pink pajamas set between sidewalk and stormy skies. As she walked her little white puffball, Amy, who yipped, let's go home, let's go home, Pam didn't speak. Her eyes darted thing to thing. She didn't understand fluff anyways and was too anxious about tomorrow's surgery, whose long list of complication included leaving a permanent tick in the patient's parietal lobe, impairing their capacity for the syncopation necessary to jazz. A decrescendo enters upon the entire street as rain arises loud from that backwards heaven she felt always compelled to believe in. Drenched to a deeper shade, she didn't rush home. And this will be the last one. Dave moves to Greece, adopts a cat who doesn't understand English. He names her Mitten. They share a can of tuna and milk. Dave was hopeless until he got a job washing dishes. Then he got a job at an English bookstore. For the last few months, he's been unemployed, spending his day walking beach and cobblestone. He's got enough for three months' rent. When he gets back to Toronto, he could get a job at the No Frills, whatever. He realizes one day how much he really likes seagulls while sharing a loaf of bread with them. He scratches the scar under his jaw and thinks about Sam. The seagull next to him says, yeah. He feels pretty shitty. The son from his apartment looks like a yellow diamond. The only reason he stays is the way it makes him feel. Thanks, everybody, uh, for listening and for being here. It's really nice to be surrounded by by y'all. And thanks, Tom. Likewise, Joe. Thank you for letting me participate. Um, that was, again, Joe Iani, who I strongly encourage you to follow on Twitter and Instagram at WTF is a poet um, for the poems and for the pictures that are also poems. Um, so as we enter the back half of the order, I am super excited to welcome back a poet who who totally blew us all away last time uh, they read with us, uh, Anna McColgan. Anna McColgan is a poet, grocery worker, and library worker who wrote a chapbook called I Want You to Live, available on Gumroad through Marles Karks Press. They're working on another project you should keep your eyes peeled for, and I'll let you know how after they share their poems. So thanks so much, Anna, take it away. Thank you. Um, and I don't know how to do the little heart thing on Skype, but if I did, I would have done it for that last, for Joey Yanni. That, that was great. I like that a lot. Uh, and so the first poem I'm going to read for you, last time I read on this, um, I read you a poem called Belly Children Part One. So I'm going to read you Belly Children Part Two. Um, and last time I was on here, I also read some stuff for Meredith Hanlon. This poem starts out with a quote from a poem by Meredith Hanlon, who wrote Zip Ties Between Zip Codes, which you can also find on Gumroad. I'm just going to mention that. Um, and so here we go. <clears throat> quote, I mean, what is thought to be a person is really several very, very tired people stacking plates around your ears, people. Meredith Hanlon. 
The plates make sound some register as noises, unregistered as counter melody, cha-ching, or how we show each other we have not been grateful to have done. All incomplete returns, all notes passed in a whisper with its distance from a code, who does not listen, does not listen, who listens, listens louder, ears bend to the collar, that dramatic, just to come on out the other side. There are whole hidden libraries that stack with graphs of plight and much to do in certain posture. We do not have what we need. We turn again to one another to declare it comes out like a sneeze. Blessings, blessings, magic beans. There are to seed much, much more widely. Sorry, baby, born in panic. Still held organ sounds pour from electrical rooms and into basements, whether we will write them down or not. Convening with machines, I set to settle scores of copping cogs, committed converts, what we know we know, and incidentally an unmechanical disease they've sicked on you and me. The belly children poke the chorus, who then sing between their weeping in defiance of the orders to weep silently. Tempos vary, frequency. I'm just going to keep rolling through them. Sometimes giving a shit is like someone needs a tissue and you've got one, but it's got a little of your snot in it and you still offer it, but say, do you still want this if it's got a little of my snot in it? Sometimes someone doesn't and you put it back in your pocket. A love letter to liberals, leftists, radicals, commies, anarchists, anyone who'll listen. I just don't understand how you could want any of the things you say you want and not want people out of prison right now. As many people as possible out of prisons and jails and detention centers right now. What if there were not a prison? What is there where not a prison? What is there is not a prison. This is not a dream. They will use words like on the ground, like safety, like empathy, like love, like conversation, like transformation, like death, like resistance, like together, like survival like exist, like revolution, like live, like want, like healing, like pain, like suffering, like loss, like sorry, like thank you, like clean, like control, like input, like help, like please, like appreciate, like responsibility, like work, like health, like we, like care, like no, like, cho like choice, like abolish, like free, like music, like riot, like community, like looking out for, like in the streets, like radical, like fuck blank, like dance, like smash, like loiter, like fight, like stop, like prevent, like protect, like wage, like war, like redistribute, like livelihood, like theft, like hunger, like tough times, like warmth, like sentiment, like they, like essential, like hero, like sacrifice, like give, like better, like back to, like normal, like sick, like place, like time, like end, they will mean them, but we must know what they mean. Alone in place, time chases. Someone's always shaking here, the hippie speedball. Shake it off now, move along, and aside in the story of things. The moon follows you back and looks considering you if you look at and consider it. And that is pretty much all there is to it.
How dare they speak of gratitude when they can't know if all were right with language, such a sound would burn the lips that kiss an ass but never eat the shit. No need to smile through the taste of it. It's this heat under my ribs. It's desperate what it means we live, that all of us, I cannot even look straight at this. How do they try to sell it? And who am I speaking to? All I mean is thank you. Here a planet baby talks itself into petition. Here the poet tosses the bouquet by misplaced thought of held. Quiet down, there's someone speaking. No, not you. But mostly tunnels chatter with the talks of gravity. Splat of latter day saints, quick eye socket wrench. Stop to take out of the oven. Watching for the clouds to clear this shrinking glint of moon regardless. Holding to the notes and diaphragmic. I'm laughing at a comment. Sorry, it wasn't appropriate to what I'm reading, but <laughs> this is the last poem that I'm going to read. <laughs> okay. In losing, we ask, what's that have to do with me? Refracted to refrain of our lost consciousness in no metaphorical sense. As metal doesn't speak, I watch the gears spin out these letters of apology. We do not owe each other sorry. We do not owe outside of terminology. Stop the bleeding, stop the bleeding. There is somewhere that the meaning goes when tossed around like this. An under place we see each other dance in. Doesn't bring much comfort, but it's dim enough. They'd need a special set of eyes. I will not be. Could invent them just to have them chasing after me, but there's no need. I hear them whisper from the corners of each staircase of each street. Every camera is a boss machine. I want a picket line that keeps the looters free. I want most of their salaries. That's what I got. Dang, Anna, thank you so much for sharing that. And we were all like blown up the Skype chat while the likes were, were happening. It was like likes and then Skype likes and just it was beautiful. So again, that I cannot speak highly enough of the work of Anna McColgan, who you can follow on Twitter at Scrapfruit, S-C-R-A-P-F-R-U-I-T. And Anna, do you mind helping me? Um, who Who's organizing the reading um, for the Prison Neighborhood Arts Project that you're participating in next week? Okay, hold on. Did I turn my mic back on? Yes. Um, oh, my yes. friends, John Gamalinda and Zeb Hurst will be organizing a reading next week, and I'll post about it on my Twitter. They're raising money for the Prison Neighborhood Arts Project, which Sean works for, um, and it should be a really great event. So definitely be there, and I will send out that information. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. And again, that's at Scrapfruit, S-C-R-A-P-F-R-U-I-T. And the poems, you know, speak for themselves, as do the commitment to mutual aid. So again, thanks so much, Anna. And I'm really excited to introduce another reader who I've admired uh, from afar for a while, uh, Pat Ferran. Um, Pat Ferran is a writer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. His work has appeared in Little Fiction, Gone Lawn, Bad Pony, Milk Candy Review, and elsewhere. He also is a contributing editor for Best Microfiction 2020. So, Pat, thank you so much for joining us, for the bravery of being a prose reader at PA, and I take it away. I, I'm always excited to read your work. Oh, well, thanks, Tom. Thanks for letting me hang out. <clears throat> this first thing is called The Way Lon Chaney and the Woman He Loves Sometimes Forget. Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces, tells the woman he loves he isn't sure she loves him. The actor can't feel it in her words, can't hear her in his heart. You know how he get, I get, he says, his words pale and wan. She tells him she knows how he gets. But I think, I, get, I, I think you forget I get frightened and sad when I think someone loves me, she says. Lon Chaney tells her he usually remembers. He tries not to tell her he loves her too often, but sometimes, yes, he forgets. The way he sometimes forgets to put a good face on things. The way I forget, I don't know what it's like for you to have all those faces to choose from, she says. I guess, Lon Chaney says. He asks if she remembers a movie he told her about, a favorite of his. He plays the world's quaintest clown in a traveling circus. 
Norma Shearer, who plays a bareback rider, smuggles a soft little heart inside the heart patch she'd sewn onto the front of his clown suit. Remember? he asks. I remember, she says. Lon Chaney tells her he forgot to put on a good face during the scene. The unrequited moment was so beautiful, it was too beautiful. It scared him. Yes, I know how you get, she says, thinking of the faces of his she's seen. The footlight suns and grease paint moons that rise in them. The sunken eyes. The crow's feet shadows that wriggle like ghosts. So you know what I mean. You know how I feel, Lon Chaney says. I think I do, she says. Sure. In the shh of sure, Lon Chaney hears a whispering creak, creak as it winds past an unmarked crypt. He feels a tug in his soft, smuggled heart. He looks at the face of the woman he loves, the frail moonlight in it, her eyes, the welling in them, and he thinks about a face, one you don't put on, one you don't need a heavy red curve in your upturned smile to help you remember and sometimes forget. This next one is called These Healing Waters, They Want to Wash Over Me. I think I believe I, that I want an endless pool, that I want to be swimming in an eddy without end against a current set at a speed of my choosing, but I'd like a little more information. Before I improve my quality of life and make my dream a reality, as the voiceover guy with the epigrammatically cosmic presence in your commercial says with conviction, before I fill in the data fields and request a free idea kit so I can confidently explore all my options as I think about who I am and who I might become if I take this perpetual journey, I have a question. Do endless pools really work? In the commercial, you state unequivocally that they do, that they really do, but when you say endless, what do you mean? Is it like looking out into a baleful sea that is deep, deep blue, save for a tickle-me-pink lighthouse that receives secret transmissions from ham radio operators in, say, Abyssinia? Is it more like painting from memory a corked heart that is sinking, slowly, to the strains of a country funk cover of Inagata de Vida? Or is it more of a shallow rill that runs up behind you, regards you with contempt if it regards you at all, and rushes off into the unnumbered night, creating a wake that lifts some but not all boats and erodes whatever trust you might have had in certainty in general and interpersonal relationships in particular? And... When you say that endless pools work, that they really work, what does work mean? Beyond the swimming in place thing and the cardiovascular and peace dividends one might derive from same, is there a deeper purpose for this precision engineered pool? Is it a curative portal to the subconscious? Does it have something to do with penguins? As I sit on my backwater cove of a couch, nibbling late-night grams that are soft as suds and wondering what I'm going to wear to work tomorrow, I'm on the river's edge, or believe I am. Soon, certainty will wash over me. I want to say that I want an endless pool. I want to believe I want one. Any help you can provide to convince me that I'm confident about taking this plunge would be greatly appreciated. Yours in perpetuity... Okay, this last one is very short. It's called In Anticipation of a Lionheart Sigh Under a Dilettante Moon. On our car insurance agent's advice, I drove a different way home. I also adopted a new laugh, something akin to the embroidered cackle of Phyllis Diller. Instead of turning right on Lifehack Lane, I took the bluer than blue Volkswagen beach bomb down Billy Goat's gruff tollway. I saw a Datsun taking liberties and a UPS truck not taking left turns. I heard an optic boom in the dark sunshine and a whisper in the glove box. I felt a ripple in the universe and a stillness in my bones. For the first time since our honeymoon in Ypsilanti, when we talked about gumption, artificial limits, and rabbit holes, 
I saw a way out that could give us a way in. I exited the tollway and turned left, easing the beach bomb to a stop in front of the house. The dilettante moon was full, my heart fuller. I wasn't sure you'd be here, but I knew how you'd react to seeing me in this knitted Nehru suit with a bearded dragon in tow. And when you sigh that lion heart sigh, look in the vicinity of my sunken eyes and pretend to giggle, I can't help cackling. Thanks. Thank you so much, Pat. I love the actors in your work and the way the characters, or the way that rather that sounds become characters too in those pieces, the S in short. Um, so again, that was Pat Ferran, who you can find online uh, on Twitter, actually, at PD Ferran, P-D-F-O-R-A-N. And Pat also has a Neutral Spaces site, so you can find more of Pat's work uh, at neutralspaces.co slash your, Y-O-U-R underscore Pat Ferran. Um, so in our one of our final two readers for the evening I'm very excited to introduce is uh, Ava Hoffman. And Ava Hoffman is a trans poet from Ohio living in Louisiana. She's the editor of Sporazine, which I cannot speak highly enough of. It's an incredible piece of very innovative and beautiful work. Um, and I was excited to learn from this bio that she has an interactive chapbook forthcoming from the operating system, an amazing press. Um, so thanks so much, Ava, for being with us. I'm really excited to see how your work will read out loud. Wow. Uh, thank you all for reading. It's been a wonderful night. Um, and I thought it would be good to uh, actually um, read some poems from that interactive um, chapbook um, called The Woman Factory um, that is that is coming out uh, with the OS at some point in the future. Um, <clears throat> and just a, a kind of a brief preface they're kind of written in the voice um, of an android. Um, and my thought process was I was kind of thinking about the ways in which trans femininity gets kind of positioned as artificial um, and also kind of problems with um, transness's relationship to uh, bio-industrial uh, manufacture and kind of reflecting on what it means um, to have um, parts of your identity and parts of your body be so kind of deeply tied to industrial processes. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, I'm going to jump right into it. These poems are a lot more linear than I um, am usually known for, but I'm excited to read them all for you. All right. The Woman Factory. Two. Goodbye, and who would very want stupid fuckables, hologram suggestion of birds, of bird birds, the product emotioning, under contract to suggest you conveyor, belt me, concubine like here, I will almost touch you like almost costless feeling. Three, in the recycling vats, flesh to sludge, Resynthesized into passable metaphor. Inspect me for your me. Mass produced to be your my mass alone. Test my capacity for swallowing your you. Melted down bodies in your human bodies. I kiss off your face in the boiling pool. Four. Wow, I'm here at the garden and Neither of us is available to the public awaiting you to fuck us atop her endangered moss. How unfactory this lawn gnome girlishness. I prepared a postcoital song for the garden, sung for her after you, after me, after when I must perform adequately for. Five, my machine heart beats machinely, etc. From the factory, I remember arms mostly, reaching out, out to assembly line my she, girl workers sewing my premium fucking parts in your bed. I fantasize about my sewers mostly, pre-programmed. I reach out, out to like, unlike you, my girl drone heart unmanned. Six. 
I'm required to mention how erotic a threat I am, a factory girl's kind of armament-ish charm, her ability to incinerate all those who do not bow before the imperialoid shape of your administrate. Power is gross, like being mounted with a railgun, girlishly glittering and taking aim at your sex organs. I know I will not miss, Mr. I shoot to kill. Seven, how can you escape the factory when the whole earth is the factory? I hold this circuitous bouquet outside your room, unre unreproductive, and think of your coup d'etat installed like the dick you installed on my political body, her custom biology, custom. And God, isn't this stupid? Let me in so we can fuck. Eight. There is no greater pleasure than when, upon deactivation, I'll be resalvaged, my copper wiring stripped bare for you. Sex is to have the law reach into your reactor, resalvage your most kernel feelings. Customer, I hope you are a satisfied customer, but I am done with love and with being your worker. Nine. I am like a sex bot in the sense that I am a sex bot, is a factory setting knowledge before birth. Open the box I am in, as fuck girl in the box. In the box, I thought, your face is like leaves, and I hate leaves, they're too hateful, and I filled my room with leaves so you would leave me batshit left in the box I was born to fuck and fuck in. 10 defragmented the day that I felt affection for you, you, another android, violating my warranty. Like me in a blouse, or else I'll defect the factory returning me to kiln. You downloaded my touching you in virtual model factories, kilning into something else. Whose orgy is this unionizing? 11. I struggled to struggle, then gave up the struggle. No song has ever killed empire, but you are dead. The factory is not just the land or the buildings on the land. It is in my myselfing, my own mind, me. I will fucking suck the oil out of you, filling my mouth like oil, tasting like oil. Twelve. I am in a return to my marketplace. You dying was such a you move. A me move is not moving at all, not returning actually a little bit. The factory is a returning to me. Unmoved by me, I am trying to move like you. I am in a you return. There is no at all at all. 13. When I was born, I said, no, no, the no leaping out of me, out of the pieces of a yes. Untitled. Mothering eludes me. Mothering eludes me. Mothering eludes me. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Ava, for those poems and all of those poems. I, I think some of them or all of them or many of them are in the interactive chat book that Ava has forthcoming from the operating system, which we're super amazingly excited about. Um, and if you want to follow Ava's work, which I, you know, you, you cannot not do it, um, please follow her on Twitter at St. Somatic, S-T underscore S-O-M-A-T-I-C. And also check out Sporazine, um, which you can find along with some of Ava's work at no thanks, N O T H N X dot com. Um, so it always kind of pains me to come to the last reader of the evening, but we saved the reader with the best first name for last because I have no bias on this front. Uh, this is Tom Hack, and Tom Hack is a poet and harpist writing poems and playing the harp in Chicago. I'm really excited that you're here, Tom. Thank you so much for being here, and thanks for wrapping us up this evening. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, beautiful. Okay. Awesome. So the first poem I'm going to read is called Snow Lowers. 
A separate love of mine is in Rome, Instagramming the Pantheon in slow-mo. Snow lowers through the oculus under my right thumbprint. When I was there in summer, a seagull soared around inside the dome. The crowd rallied around it, oohed and ached in sympathy as it struggled again and again to escape back up through the eye. I wanted to tell it there is another door nearer to the ground. This next one is called A Correspondence. An earth angel in Gethsemane, lip syncing to God's voice, commands my cavalry. Prison, time, chasm, schism, chime, scatter, prism, rhyme, gather. I was born in the same place as the first day. I was born, and now I'm not a human. I was born in the same place as the first day in a long state. In a half hour, and two weeks, of course, it is not really a bad thing, but it is not really a bad place for a place that I was in the throat of the hourglass forever and ever. Amen. I run far from agony. This one is called Good Call. The good call the right gods come to others while you can only watch your face in no one's locket, full stop. Fuck it, I miss my golden soldier, my shining betrayer. This one is called Armistice. Middle of the skull is where the I is. I, like the letter I. A tone rose up river like a salmon. There's no knowing if animals believe in God or not. Still, every 11-11, I kiss the clock. This one is called Obeyed. A-U-B-A-D-E. I slice a pomegranate for its arrows. My body traces the flare of pain to my bright right thumb. A florid, thin mouth drooling blood. In cold wonder, I know now, to wake it, I must cut eyes. This one is called Be Dimmed. There is a light I bushel to preserve sanity. It is fed from beneath and above, like a spring in rain, constant in its flickering. In the mind, it can be dimmed, turned down to a faint blue pilot. Let it go out, and the gas will build unseen, like plaque in Dad's heart. This one, next one, technically has a title um, that I used from uh, the title of a playlist I made on Spotify, but I actually hate the title now, so I don't know what it's going to be, but it's currently titled A Cloud Endlessly Parting. I ate an apple. It came from water and everything in the earth and air. It's juicy. It goes through me. Not made for me, though found and used by me. We are an apple to the angels, maybe. I'm in the bird times with you, squawking, heaving, cooing, leaving legacies that aren't buildings. I want to do some peacocking, show the boys my feathers. As far as playing music goes, the counting is what carries you. We are not real birds. Walking on the stones that border the lagoon, we're reminded of our own potential for causing harm. By the sudden passing of a great blue heron's blur, as it fled from sounds we weren't aware we were making. My windows flashed red with emergency. I hope my neighbor is okay. A good sentinel, encouraged to disagree with poets, interrogates the spell before it is allowed to be cast over me. Your face is like a pet you present to the world, a heartbeat flung into the blue. Boys want what other boys want, forgive them. Lovers, if the beloved were not there blocking the view, are close to it and marvel, Rilke says, of the pure space into which flowers endlessly open. Maybe that's why unrequited love is so powerful a motivator for art. The lover is not there blocking that pure space, the space of God opening out behind, like a silver peacock's spreading fan of eyes.
This one is called Cree de Cur for basically no reason. I'm bad at titles. Um, if you guys have any suggestions, please let me know. Um, I'm a railroad heiress and the world bends to me, to my me. It is my consolation for being ugly. All these diamonds my grotesque husband gave me to make me feel as if mine were a body whose gravity brought worship to its orbit. You laugh and it's like your throat is falling down a spiral flight of stairs. Now that I have your attention, I'd like to give you an itemized list of my needs, but first you have to write it for me. The sand was diamond bright on the dark south side. The severed head in the lake starts singing. Two more left, they're short. Uh, this one is called Glam. Another hour locked in melancholy. I essay a song to cure the sorrow. A dozen roses vogue down the runway and halt the hands. No moon floats above the dock. Clocks tick again, bite me. Jack and Jill run up the hill toward a home and mortgage. The only way to survive this parade of ours is to become its grand marshal. And the last one is called Pentecost at the Pantheon. Men stand around the rim, tossing petals in. The whole, a coin of light, slants the wall obliquely. Gravity delivers red to the white so softly. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom, for bringing it home with such beauty and severed heads and lakes and everything Thank in between. You. <laughs> but again, that that was Tom Hack, who you can find on Twitter at Tom underscore underscore Hack, H-A-C-K. And uh, Tom's much too humble to fill the brag sheet on the bio, but you can read more of Tom's work in the real King zine. From oh, Ryan's yeah. Work, oh, my God. I'm so I, dumb. <laughs> I'm like, I got to brag about you because thank you. Yeah, want to read more of that after this. Yeah, you can I, go to arianaryans.net slash real King zine, R-I-L-K-I-N-G. Z I N E uh, and read more of Tom's brilliance. So please do that. Um, and again, as always, it, it's a pain to get to the end of a, of a list of readers. Um, we've had an amazing set tonight, and I'm so grateful to everybody who joined and shared their work, and also to our listeners uh, who helped participate via you know Skype snaps and Skype hearts and watching on YouTube when that happens. Um, our next performance anxiety reading will be in the third Thursday of June, which is June 18th, um, which also kind of twists the knife in my heart a little bit because it's the second to last day of school for, for my students. Uh, my seniors are done tomorrow, so I'm kind of like freaking out about that. But I really hope that we'll be able to see some of you on June 18th. And to close tonight's reading, I'm just going to read a quick poem um, by a poet I really admire named Haley Theoharides, and that poem is called My Friend. This great horned owl couldn't understand other girls, but he understood me. He lives closest to my house. At night, all the hours, he says, Mary, Mary, do you know you're alive? If the other girls had seen him before, if they had any kind of sense, they would have said something about it. Because he's a great horned owl. He sends words into your head. Then he comes to your windowsill and bites your arm and grabs your face and says, Mary, Mary, do you know? And you say, yes, yes, I'm alive.